Inna presta coclina et thalla frolleca o kelje rhyn under forlingar o kjera sjolra nöst in höge föll och gör vila glåa höfi Hello my dear friends, how are you? My name is Ari Ferger and today I'm going to talk about the Norse goddess Freya. But for the sake of understanding, I will pronounce Freya. Freya was a central goddess in Norse mythology, the most important goddess of old Scandinavian religion and spirituality. As she was the only named goddess from the fertility tribe of gods, the Vanir, she was automatically associated as being a fertility deity. It's true that we see a couple of similarities between this deity and other pagan fertility deities of other cultures. For instance, both Freya and the Germanic goddess Nerthus had fertility celebrations that involved cards, which seem to play an important and large role in fertility symbolism. Cards driven in processions, and there are even accounts of having the goddess or her representation in the cart itself driving her into sacred groves where people were sacrificed in honor of these two goddesses. Sacrifices to ensure fertility in the land. Freya's importance in Old Norse societies was far greater than we may think and her cult lasted even during the conversion of old Scandinavian societies into Christianity. In fact, her cult remained even after the final stages of the conversion in Iceland. We have accounts of the cult of Freya still existing in the 14th and 15th centuries in Iceland. Freya stood for the cult of fertility in later times more clearly than the god Freyr, whose association with the figure of the king waned with the establishment of the Christian Church. But the fact that she survived as a goddess even in Christian times and that she was such a powerful force in the pagan world that Christianity had a hard time getting rid of her more than any other deity shows that her importance went far beyond fertility aspects. There are clear evidences of Freya being a goddess associated with sexuality, especially women's sexuality. This also includes prostitution. But it's very important to draw a line in this. With the conversion to Christianity, obviously prostitution became something abominable and an awful sin. The seductive power of women was a direct conflict with the celibacy of Christian priests. And this reshaped the entire social consciousness towards prostitution. However, for the pagans, this trait in the goddess meant that she was good to call on matters of the heart. In many pagan societies, prostitution wasn't a sin. It was directly associated with the powers of sexuality and love, and people would ask prostitutes to teach them about love matters, seduction, sexual tips. In certain pagan societies, prostitution was even used in magical aspects and divinity. There used to be highly specialized prostitutes who were also priestesses of temples of deities associated with fertility. And such priestesses slash prostitutes were not for the common folk, only for kings to lie down with them, have sex and through that highly ceremonial act, very ritualistic in nature, Kings would know their future, would know the will of the gods towards specific matters, etc. Also, sexual intercourse was used by certain sorceresses, seers, shamans, to facilitate the contact with the spiritual world, taking advantage of the energy released in an orgasm for spiritual purposes. It is thought that Freya was an elite goddess, most accessible to the nobility. Her name literally means lady, which can be understood as a title for women of the nobility expressed in modern Scandinavian female titles. 
For instance, a caning for lady is she who is richest, reinforcing Freya's connection to nobility, or also indicating Freya's noble ties. Now I feel the need to tell you what a caning is. Uh, let's make it quick because it might be a subject for another video. To quickly understand what a caning is, uh, it's a figurative language associated with Old Norse, Icelandic and Old English poetry. It's referring to something indirectly, designates something rather than calling it by its usual name. As I've said, Freya means lady, but instead of saying lady, indirectly we use other words to refer to lady, such as she who is richest, and everyone would know we are referring to lady. This was a common caning when referring to the word lady. Freya was not only associated with womanhood, female sexuality, fertility and nobility, but also with magic and sorcery as well. Freya gave the gods Seidr, a specific shamanic magic within the shamanic frame of Old Norse societies. So her connection with this type of magic turned it into a woman's trade. It was the type of magic solely used by women, and men in Old Norse societies who practiced Seidr weren't seen as men. They were seen as being effeminate. They were called Erigi, which was an insult, calling them unmanly. So Seidr was the province of women, Although Freya herself fought Odin about Seder, and Odin, a male god, became associated with female magical practices, probably demonstrating a change within the social and religious minds of Scandinavians. Freya was a shape changer and was also linked with the dead, the personification of the Sirius as described in the Addas. Freya and Odin share fallen warriors. Alf would go with Odin to Valhalla and the other half would go with Freya into Volkvanger. Like Odin, Freya presided over a never-ending battle where warriors killed each other each day only to be brought back to life to do it all over again. But Freya didn't just welcome warriors, men. There are indications that she also welcomed women after death, possibly women who died a sacrificial death. In Heikil Saga, for instance, uh, there are indications of this, and Freya is seen as a queen of the underworld, her home being in the land of the dead. Yes, I'm, I'm sure you are thinking right now, but what about Hel? As I've said in the videos I made for the goddess Hel, she is a goddess of the underworld. A goddess, not THE goddess. The underworld in Norse mythology and in the religious pagan beliefs wasn't a single place governed by a single deity. The underworld was part of the afterlife and it was governed by many gods because it's a complex network of realities. Even gods that have houses in other places can also govern in other places other than their domains. Freya was a goddess of life and death, love and magic, peace and war. She can be a goddess who gives and a goddess who takes, creation and destruction, the very personification of nature of the Mother Earth, the constant flourishing of life, a cycle of birth, life, death and rebirth. Everything must die in order to give way to new life, a constant cycle perfectly expressed in many Norse deities, especially in Freya. For instance, in the archaeological evidences of the Hosberg ship, an outstanding burial absolutely dedicated to the goddess Freya, the burial tapestries depict Freya conjuring both her death and love magic. Battle goddesses such as Freya were depicted on runestones with birds, possibly ravens. On the previous videos about Freya's magic and cult, I have talked about sacrificed animals, in the case of Freya, cats. But each animal has a purpose. A specific animal can be sacrificed because it's the animal associated with a certain deity and by sacrificing that animal, we facilitate the contact with that specific deity. Or animals sacrificed for certain purposes, boars for harvest festivals, horses and the, as burial offerings, or for peace and prosperity or linked in ability, dogs for Odin and warriors of great renown, cats and pigs for fertility, etc. So ravens or other specific birds perhaps were sacrificed for battle magic. 
this only to add yet another animal to the cult of Freya. In one of the Eddic poems, Locasena, uh, Freya is accused of whoring. It's Loki who accused Freya of having slept with all of the gods and elves, including her brother, Freyr. In the myths, it is said that incestuous marriage was usual among the Vanir tribe of gods. The gods Freyr and Freya may thus be considered to be a married couple, even though they are brother and sister. Incest was not common in Old Norse societies. It, was, it, was, it wasn't even seen as a natural thing, a good thing. It wasn't practiced as if it were something completely fine. The Vanir gods do it, why shouldn't we? No, that wasn't the case. This incestuous relationship between brother and sister is the personification of the relationship between two fertility gods, who were born from the same deity, who is also a god of fertility and plenty, Njordr. Njordr has two children, the perfect embodiment of the powers of fertility, two different polarities, male and female, which together bring fertility upon the land through fecundity, through the sexual act of reproducing more life. This incestuous relationship is a metaphor for the fertility of the natural world, which needs two polarities to maintain fertility and the continuation of life. But on the other hand, it's possible that this incestuous relationship is an evidence of marriages between royal families, between cousins. If the gods did it between brother and sister, between cousins would seem less abominable. It was very common, these incestuous relationships between royal families, to keep the bloodline pure and to maintain alliances. Since Freyr and Freya are connected to nobility, it's possible that this story of their love and sexual relationship is an evidence of incestuous relationships amongst the nobility of Old Norse societies. However, that practice might have ended or it took such proportions that it had to stop. And as such, in the myths, Freya, in late Old Norse literature, gained a husband, someone who wasn't her blood, Odr. It is said in the myths that Odr was absent for a long time and Freya had wept for his absence and had gone out in search of him. The most obvious explanation here is to identify Odr with Odin. Because of the similarities of the names, the long absence of this god, Odin in the myths was also absent for a long time in exile, and his marriage with Freya, a goddess who in some accounts is identified with Frigga, Odin's wife. Although it isn't certain if Odr is indeed Odin or another god, a forgotten god. This is an aspect I would like to talk about actually, uh, even though in the Old Norse literature Frigga and Freya are presented to us as being two distinct goddesses, the similarities between them are obvious and the differences are superficial. It's very possible that Freya and Frigga are the same goddess. With the conversion to Christianity, there was the need to split the same goddess in two. As I've said in the previous videos about Freya's cult linked to fertility and cats, in the process of conversion, the Norse gods and cosmic realms became equivalents of biblical figures and places to facilitate the conversion by creating similarities between religions, so people would easily adopt something which was more familiar to them. Odin became the equivalent of God, Baldr with Jesus, Loki with the devil, but since Freya was one of the most important deities, certainly the most important goddess of Old Norse religion, the obvious Christian equivalent was to convert her with a Virgin Mary, the only important female figure in Christian mythology. But the fact that Freya represented sexuality, female sexuality and magic, was reason enough not to be the equivalent of the Virgin Mary. Freya was seen by Christian thinking as a whore, so they couldn't possibly turn a whore into the Virgin Mary, a virgin. So during the process of conversion, the goddess was split in two, thus the possible creation of Frigga. And let's not forget, as I've said in the previous video about the god Freyr, 
Freyr was the divine lord before the introduction of the cult of Odin in Scandinavia, and Freya had a relationship with the divine lord. Freyr lost his title as the divine lord and Odin took that title. Odin was the new god of rulers, of kings, he became the king of the gods, the divine ruler. And this may be one of the reasons why Freya married the divine ruler. Because before, she was already linked with nobility and being the lady, and Freyr losing his title as lord, Freya had to continue to be the lady by marrying Odin. But in the Christian thinking, a whore couldn't be married with God. So let's introduce Frigga and cover up this mess and let the pagans be content. This is a possibility which I would like to explore on another video. Freya has a couple of names, one of those is Vanadis. This name can only be found in Snorri Sturluson's Ilfaginning, and it's merely a caning for the goddess who is one of the Vanir. Vanadis means Vanir woman. However, this name seems to have a connection with the Dysir. It is possible because many of her names indicate that Freya was also a domestic goddess, meaning that there were private cults, shrines, domestic cults to her, and the Dysir were worshipped both publicly but mostly privately. Sacrifices in honor of goddesses, giving goddesses, female land spirits and female ancestors. Freya was indeed linked to the world of land spirits and also as a giving goddess, which were once realities which made part of everyday life of the people of Old Norse societies, magical work in privacy uh, within the family and cult, cults and rituals. Freya is the archetype of the Volva, the female practitioner of Seder. As I've said, Seder is a form of pre-Christian Norse magic and shamanism. The Volva was a seeress, a sorceress, who traveled from town to town performing acts of Seder in exchange for a variety of things. Freya occup occupied this role amongst the gods. There are multiple accounts in the sagas and poems about her aspect as a sorceress, a practitioner of magic. This aspect also describes the role of a queen, or in a more tribal aspect, uh, the role of the wife of the chieftain in Germanic societies, especially before the Viking Age. And let's not forget that Freya is connected to nobility. Among the Germanic tribes, especially in organized military tribes, they were governed by a, a chieftain and his wife. The wife of the chieftain or the leader, according to the Roman accounts, a role within the tribe was to foretell the outcome of military actions by means of divination and to influence that outcome by means of active magic. This is one of the historical facts that reinforce Freya's connection with magic performed by the nobility. Women in old Scandinavian societies were heavily involved in sacrificing to fertility deities, and some fertility priests and priestesses may actually have been of high noble birth, even royal. Women held very high positions as sacrificial and ritual leaders. Alright, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video about the goddess Freya. Thank you so much for watching, see you on the next video and talk pretty long.